Hi, how are you doing? I'm Mohamed Sadri, a member of Microelectronics System Design Research Group of DU Kaiserslautern. And this is video number six of our Zinc training series, and it's titled Creating Custom XI Slave Peripherals the Easy Way. So there are a lot of methods that you can use to create, in fact, XI slave blocks for your custom modules that you create. And what we want to emphasize on is we want to make it as easy as possible so that everybody can do it. So here is the topics that I want to talk about today. First, a kind of small introduction and motivation of why we should do that. So why do we need to be able to realize our own XI slave interfaces? And then um, different methods and different types that exist for these XI slave blocks. And then a brief overview of the overall idea that we use for realizing modules with these XI slave blocks. And then I take one example design and then I go through that example design through a practical experiment to design the real module with its XI slave interfaces and to make it run on the ZC706 board. So here, Suppose that you have a task in which you have the zinc device, or generally speaking, any other FPGA, and then there are some data which are residing outside of the system, and you want to read this data, and then you want to transfer this data to the CPUs that you have in your system. So if you are using the Zinc device, obviously the CPU is the ARM host. If you are using any other FPGA, probably the CPU is microblade. So if I want to read this data and to transfer it to the ARM host, the ARM host and the ARM subsystem that I have here, they are entirely talking based on XI and XI interfaces, XI protocol that we have talked about it previously. And so what I need to do is, in fact, when I receive this data, I need to get the data and transfer the data to the CPU based on that XI protocol. So I need a logic which is capable of talking based on this protocol. And as a very quick solution, if it's just a simple piece of data that I want to read, then I put one XI GPIO it's kind of module which is already available. So I put my XI GPIO, and then I configure XI GPIO to generate an interrupt whenever a new data is arrived. So the new data arrives, the interrupt gets generated, the CPU sees the interrupt, and then, for example, through the GP0 port of the Zinc device, this XI master will perform a read transaction to this XI slave and will read the data. But this is not always true. It's not always true that you can use a simple XI GPIO to perform any kind of, in fact, input-output transfer task that you want. Just imagine that receiving the data from outside involves a kind of complicated communication protocol. For example, there are a set of handshake signals which should be set correctly by your logic before you can receive the data. Or, for example, suppose that I, I'm not interested in receiving all of the data, but I'm, receiving in, I'm interested in receiving just some specific pieces of the data. So every time the data arrives, I want to first examine the data, and then if it is of interest, then I want to transfer it to the CPU. It happens many times that you need a kind of custom design here for interfacing to the outside world. And an XI GPIO, which is a kind of pre-built module and ready-to-use module and is not really customizable, it cannot be used here. 
it happens in many situations that you need to realize your own logic here to create your custom interfaces to the rest of the logic, to the rest of the world that you have. So we, we need to be able, in fact, to create our own custom peripheral. And our own custom peripheral should be able to talk to the CPU subsystem through the XI protocol. So the custom peripheral that I create should, for example, feature an XI slave block so that the CPU can perform XI transaction to it and can do the data transfers. Or another example. Suppose that I have my Zinc device, and then there are a set of computational tasks that I want to do, and I know that I can implement these computational tasks directly on hardware. And if I do that, I can do those computational tasks much faster and with much lower power consumption. Because I directly realize the computational task on hardware instead of letting a CPU to do it cycle by cycle, which usually takes longer time and higher amount of energy. I want to directly implement my computational task on hardware. So I develop, in fact, a kind of hardware accelerator, which is basically my computational task. And this hardware accelerator that I have created should be able to talk to the CPU subsystem. And the CPU subsystem is talking XI. So my hardware accelerator should be able in fact, to understand the XI protocol, and at least it should be able to respond to the XI requests coming from outside correctly. Again, this is another example that shows that the RTL, the logic that I am realizing, needs to be able to understand and talk to the XI devices to the other XI devices in the system. So <clears throat> up to now, we have come into conclusion that we need to be able to talk to XI. So what possible solutions do I have to add this feature to my own logic? The possible solutions are the following. First. Your logic needs to talk to an XI interface. Well, you can read the XI specification, which is a complete document. It's coming from ARM. And then based on that specification, you can develop a logic, a set of RTL codes, which will enable your module to send and receive data through XI. So the first option, which is kind of for very professionals and it's kind of time consuming and difficult is that you develop the whole thing yourself. <laughs> However, there are other options. For example, there are a set of IP blocks that are called IP interface. So we have a set of Xilinx IPIF units and each of these IPIF units is specialized to talk, in fact, to a specific type of XI interface, or is specialized to perform a specific type of transfer task. For example, there is an IPIF that allows you to instantiate this block inside your module. And then when you instantiate this IPIF inside your module, in fact, you can talk to the other devices based on XI light protocol. Or there's an IPIF for, in fact, talking to the outside world, to the XI world, to the XI burst transfers. So what basically the IPIF does 
is that it simplifies talking to the XY world. So at one side, it gets connected to the XY world and it generates all of those required signals with required timings. And on the other side, the IPIF provides us with a very simple and easy to use memory-like interface. An interface which is basically an address, a read enable, a write enable, size of data which should be transferred. So the interface here is a very easy to understand interface, set of simple signals, so that the developer, which is going to develop his own logic, can very easily develop the required logic to talk to this interface. And then the IPIF is responsible for taking these signals and converting them and making them compatible with the XI timing and XI complicated uh, signaling and protocol. So IPIFs, they are the second way. Then, there is another way, and that is when you use the Vivado environment, there is this wizard that allows you to create custom peripherals, and through the wizard, you are able, uh, in fact, to create units with Axi slave or master plugs with some sample pre-generated code. So when you use this wizard with Vivado, the Vivado will also produce a kind of code for you, kind of RTL for you, which is already working and is doing the basic functionality which is required for that specific type of XI plug. And usually it's a very good idea to take this pre-generated code and to work on it a little, to change it a little, and to adapt it to the type of application that we have. Finally, another method, in fact, to uh, create modules with XI plugs is to use the HLS flow. So using Vivado HLS, you directly code in C. You don't code in uh, Verilog or VHDL. You directly code in C. And then through few lines of code, you can realize different types of XI master or slave blocks very, very easily. So actually, you, you write a set of C program lines that just initiates the required transactions or accepts some transactions and then we add a HLS environment will convert all of your C code automatically into a suitable RTL which is producing all of those required signals for the actual protocol and with correct timing. For this video, what I want to show you is in fact the third option. So I use Vivado environment and then I ask it to generate some almost ready to use code and then I customize it for my specific needs. Okay, so as we go ahead for XI slave interfaces, you will notice that there exist two types of XI slave interfaces. The first one is XI light, XI slave light. And here are the list of signals for an XI slave plug in light mode. In light mode, your XI slave does not support burst transactions. So it only transfers one word of data each time. It also does not support the ID signals. On the other hand, the other possibility for an XI4 slave block is to have an XI4 slave full, in fact, interface. And there, you have complete list of signals 
for your Axel interface. And your Axel slave block should support, in fact, burst transactions. And your Axel slave block may support also kind of responding to several transactions concurrently. And therefore, you have the IDC. So for both of the modes of our Axi slave block, Axi slave light, and Axi slave foo, we have these basically these five uh, channels. So for both of them, we have, in fact, the read address channel, read response channel, then write address channel, write response channel, and then write data. So in terms of basic structure, they are completely the same, but the Axi slave light is much simpler than an Axi slave full interface. And for many of tasks that we want to do, really an Axi slave light plug is completely enough. So we really don't need an Axi slave full interface because for many of the tasks that we do, we don't really need to support bursts and we don't really need to be able to handle several transactions concurrently. So what is this ID signal that I was talking about? Why it's important? Why does it exist? So if you look at the list of signals in Axi Foo and you compare it with the list of signals in the Axi Light, you can see that for all of the channels, the ID signals are missing. Imagine this uh, simple case. I have four Axi masters here, one Axi interconnect, and then one Axi slave. For now, suppose that my Axi slave is a simple Axi slave and is capable of performing only single bit transactions, single word transactions, and is only capable of serving one transaction at each time. In this case, this Axel slave is receiving only one transaction each time. It processes the transaction and it responds to the transaction and then it goes to the next transaction. So at each time, only one of these Axi masters is allowed to perform a read or a write operation to this Axi slave. So the Axi interconnect that I have here can assign an ID to each of these Axi masters, in fact, to each of its Axi slave ports that it has here. And whenever a transaction comes on this port, it routes the transaction to the slave. And then when the response of the transaction comes back, the Axi interconnect already knows who was the master that, that had initiated that transaction. So it routes back the response to that specific master. This is because only one master at each time is practically active and is practically performing the transaction. But now, imagine a case that you have your Axi masters and you have an Axi slave block which supports bursts and is kind of capable of answering to the requests of several masters at the same time. Suppose that, for example, it's a very high performance memory controller and can handle several requests at the same time. So if three of these guys are sending transactions at the same time, then how should the Axi interconnect recognize that the response which is coming back from the Axi slave should be routed to which of these Axi masters. So at the, at the time of routing back, 
the response from the Axel slave to the Axel master, we will have a problem. Because basically these three are running in parallel. We have three transactions ongoing in parallel. And it would be very difficult or almost impossible for the Axel interconnect to understand by itself which response should be routed where. This is why the ID signals exist. In fact, in this case, every transaction will be identified by an ID. And then, based on the ID, the response will be routed back to the suitable XI master. So if I look at my XI slave full interface, for example, I can see that for the right address channel, I have this AWID signal. So whenever an Axon master issues a transaction, it puts a value on this AWID. And then when the Axon slave is responding to this specific right transaction, on the right response channel, that we have here, on the BID signal, the Axel slave will put exactly the same ID that it had received previously through the right address channel. This way, the transactions will be identified from each other completely. Okay, so for now, the general idea that we want to follow is the following. We want to be able to create our own hardware accelerator. And I don't want to create everything myself, but I want to use what there is already there as much as possible. And how does this system is going to work? This system will have only Axel slave blocks. And then, it will have also an interrupt port. So whenever we want to use this hardware accelerator, what we do is we transfer the data to our hardware accelerator. And we enable the hardware accelerator to perform the operation. And whenever the hardware accelerator is finished with the computational task, it generates the interrupt. And when we receive the interrupt, we go and read back the response. So this block for our current design is completely a passive block. It's not going to generate or initiate any transaction by its own. And it has only as XI slave blocks. But then it has its interrupt port. And through the interrupt port, it informs the CPU when it should come and read the data and when it should come and write a new data. So for now, we don't need any Axel master plug for our hardware accelerators. But the mechanism through the interrupt really allows us to use our hardware accelerator efficiently. So I want, as a practical example, create for you a simple hardware accelerator. It happens in many of the different applications that you have a bunch of data. And in this data that you have, you want to see how many times a specific pattern has repeated. It's a kind of a statistical analysis that you do on the received data. It's used in many cases, for example, in most of database applications. This is a kind of search that you temporarily or you usually need to do. So what's the story? The story is that I have the CPU, and the CPU has a bunch of data. And I want to develop a hardware accelerator which receives this data and reports back to the CPU how many times a specific pattern has repeated in this data. 
So it has a kind of RAM. The data will be written to the RAM. And then it has a module, a kind of pattern matching module that when you are writing the data, this pattern ma matching module is also active and analyzes the data and sees if any part in the data is matching the specific pattern that we want. And then we have a kind of register in our system that when the data transfer and analysis task is finished, this register will contain a number and this number is indicating how many times the specific pattern has repeated. So here is the general operation. The CPU copies the data to the RAM of the hardware accelerator. The hardware accelerator begins the processing of the data. And as soon as it finishes, it generates an interrupt to the CPU that I have finished my processing. And as soon as the CPU receives the interrupt, it goes and reads this register. So it understands how many times that specific pattern has occurred in the text or in the data array that it has. Now, I want my hardware accelerator to talk also to the outside world. So I have a signal for my hardware accelerator. The signal gets activated when this number is above a specific threshold. For example, if the number of specific patterns that we are looking for is above 10, I want this signal also to get activated. And then my hardware accelerator has also an enable input module through which from the outside world, you can in fact enable and disable this hardware accelerator completely. So in my practical experiment that I want to do, I want to connect this signal, for example, to a LED and that signal to a simple deep switch. And then I have the ARM host of the zinc as my CPU. And then here is the hardware accelerator that I am going to develop. So here is a kind of basic structure of our hardware accelerator. Our hardware accelerator, and this is just an example of how you can do it. It's not necessarily the most efficient example, but maybe it's the simplest way to do it. So what I want to do, for my hardware accelerator, I will realize, in fact, two XI slave plugs. One XI slave plug is responsible for receiving the data. This one should be an XI slave full plug because I want to receive the data as fast as possible. And in order to do that, I should allow the CPU to, in fact, send the data in bursts. So I need an XI slave full. Then the XI slave full block contains a RAM, a memory, which is responsible for storing the data. And then it also contains this pattern matching engine, which is basically looking at the incoming data and is identifying if the specified pattern exists in the incoming data. Then the output of the pattern matching engine is a kind of counter is indicating how many, how many times this specific pattern has been repeated. And my hardware accelerator has an XI slave light block. And this XI slave light block will contain a register which I allow the CPU to read this register through the XI slave light interface of this XI slave light block. Also, the interrupt to the CPU will be generated by this XI slave light. The enable signal, the enable and the signal 
are also connected both to this axle slave light. So, my hardware accelerator, it contains two axi slave plugs, one an axi slave light, and one an axi slave full. Let's see how in Vivado we can create this plug and what's the procedure that we follow to, in fact, create the hardware that we want.